You'll never be caught needing to replenish your stash again when you subscribe to Hemper's Monthly Smoking Box. I've been told Hemper is hands down the best place to stock up on your smoking supplies, no matter the occasion. Curated with innovative and hand-selected products to ensure you are getting the absolute highest quality accessories for your experience, Hemper's monthly subscription service provides over $100 in value for only $40. Whether you prefer to get casually baked or you're a heavy hitter, there's also the convenient option to receive one box every month, three months, six months, or annually. Right now, use promo code CASUALLYBAKED10 to get started and receive 10% off a Hemper box or the XL box at Hemper.com. That's H-E-M-P-E-R.com. Promo code CASUALLYBAKED10. Welcome. You're listening to Casually Baked, the podcast. Home base for the can of curious. Thanks for tuning in. It's hot time. We had a hard time together, together. Yes, it's a hard time. We had a hard time. Hi, y'all. I'm Joe, your host and cannabis lifestyle guide. For more than 20 years, I've worked in media and experiential marketing. Everything from building brands and corporate storytelling to media management event activation, and podcast development. If these things don't come natural to you and you're struggling to build your personal or professional brand, I created this podcast especially for you. But it's also for you gondrepreneurs out there ready to create meaningful cannabis marketing that does something important for our industry. When I moved to California in 2014, I knew I was getting into the cannabis industry. I just didn't have a clue which part. I started doing my homework and attending conferences where I learned the foundation of the industry. Education was the hole that I knew I could fill and I would be great at it. I visualized myself being the voice of the modern cannabis lifestyle and making daily cannabis consumption as accepted as happy hour. During my time as the Make Magazine brand and marketing manager, I began dreaming up my own cannabis lifestyle brand on nights and weekends, and Casually Baked was officially born on October 7, 2015. With the help of friends and family who believed in my vision, I slowly built Casually Baked for four years before making the leap and going all in on my quest to spread canna confidence. I'll admit, the past couple of years have been tough for me business-wise. In 2020, I lost the bulk of my monthly income when I couldn't have people in my studio during the lockdown. And because the fees and taxes from this quote-unquote legal California cannabis market are bleeding small and regional cannabis brands dry, that too is bad for my business. When companies are stretched financially thin, most times the marketing budget is the first one to the chopping block. So why am I telling you all about my personal uphill battle in business? Because I know from experience that building a great brand by yourself and with limited resources is exhausting. And that time is our most precious resource that social media is happy to steal away and then leave us high and shadow banned if we're not carefully playing their game. While anxiety, on the other hand, flows like the bonus points with every purchase on that company credit card. When times are tough, it's hard to be a creative marketer, an energized salesperson, and a business manager all at the same time. And when your brain is foggy and your bank account's dwindling, it can be a true challenge to discern exactly where to focus your energy and efforts. So... I called up today's guest to brainstorm how we can build better brands in cannabis without breaking the bank. Mark DeMossimo is the founder and creative chief of Digo, the industry-leading agency in positive behavior change marketing. Mark founded his New York City-based ad agency in 1996. Since then, Digo has been named an Adweek Gold Best Agency 
and appeared on Inc.'s list of America's fastest-growing private companies four times. Mark wants to help folks like you and me who want to do good things for our communities through for-profit businesses. So we talk about the bones of a great brand and what positive behavior change marketing means in the cannabis category. We dissect getting attention versus adding value and how to approach social media as personal brands, entrepreneurs, and startups. We discuss ways to uncover and communicate your strategic advantage. We also explore companies with social missions and why I see value in the gift economy for my service-based business. But before we dive in, a word from our sponsor, MJ Relief. The Muscle Rub PhD formulated for what aches and pains you. And since this show is all about branding and marketing, I'm excited to let you know that a new, professionally built MJ website is in the works. The current one was built by yours truly, while I had no budget or technical skills. And I recognize it isn't a good representation of how bomb.com MJ Relief actually is. But that is being remedied. Just like MJ Relief eases the aches and pains of my bad habits of entrepreneurship. And with all this transparency, my two biggest bad habits feed each other. I'm staring at a screen way too long each day. And as a creative, that means I need to mix up my environment. So then I find myself working from spaces around the house that aren't my ergonomically designed workstation. When I notice that I'm all kinked up, I massage some MJ relief into my neck and shoulders. And, you know, maybe sometimes my jaws, my forearms, depends on the day. And then I give myself a five-minute stretch break. And I use my breath and my body to continue to undo and unwind a little bit more. If you're feeling my pain and want some muscle and joint relief of your own, head over to mjskinrelief.com. And if you're already a fan of MJ Relief, once the new website is live, I'll be kicking off an affiliate program so you can make money while spreading relief in your community. I mean, seriously, everybody wins in this deal. And to Casually Baked listeners, you always save 10% when you shop mjskinrelief.com using promo code CASUALLYBAKED, all one word. That's mjskinrelief.com. And if you're listening on your phone, scroll down in the podcast app you're using to see the episode notes where you'll find links to this offer and more from other Casually Baked partner brands. The art of building better brands requires us to try on a lot of perspectives and look from every angle. So if you need to smoke a doobie to get yourself into that open, curious, creative space, now is the time, my friend. Smoke them if you got them and settle in. It's time to get casually baked. Have you heard... KushCon is headed to Tampa this August 6th and 7th. Get ready to network with more than 7,500 hemp and cannabis professionals. Sample products from more than 300 brands and take in over 70 educational sessions at Florida's largest hemp CBD and wellness trade show. And if you work in cannabis or hemp, KushCon Tampa is a rare chance to meet directly with the nation's largest distributors and retailers. Get tickets and learn more at kush.com forward slash kushcon. And Casually Baked listeners, you'll save 50% on tickets using promo code podcast. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T at kushcon.com forward slash kushcon. It's a high time. We had a high time together. Together. Mark DeMassimo, thank you so much for joining me on an episode of the podcast. Joe, so good to be here. I, I've really been looking forward to this. Thanks so yes. much for me. After our first conversation, I was really excited to talk more with you. And then I had to go and deliver eight puppies. 
and my life got a little complicated. And so when it was time for us to record last week, my Wi-Fi wasn't working and I had no idea. And so I was like, oh no, last minute canceling. So thanks for being cool and going with the flow with me. And today I'm excited to help other cannabis brands wrap their minds around where should we be spending our energy. I know there's a lot of folks that are like me where you feel like you're a one-man band. And so like, where can we be strategically placing our efforts? So this will be a fun chat. And I think I'll probably just ask you, where do you think is the most logical place to dive in? I think we start with the personal. We should start with you and me. You mentioned that we we uh, talked a couple of weeks ago, and you know I I want to say going into that conversation that I thought it was going to be you know a conversation between one casually baked person and a marketing genius, and it turned <laughs> out it was, but it turns out that I am the casually baked person and you are the marketing genius. <laughs> And I'm, and I mean that sincerely. I feel like I met a fellow marketer and brand builder here, and you just have so many great ideas. So let's make this a brainstorm together. You know, I just think we come up with some great ideas together for cannabis brands and for this category. That's fun. And thank you for a compliment like that. So, one of the things that I've seen most recently from some cannabis folks on LinkedIn was them talking about the overwhelm of social media and feeling like they are constantly having to come up and be these, you know, content creators when that's not necessarily their wheelhouse, but then not getting the traction because they're not playing correctly with the algorithms or whatever. And, and people just saying, what are we doing? Why are we even trying to be on social media anymore? First off, I, I sympathize, and you know this is uh, this is a challenge that every level of marketing is 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 facing in every category. Um, you know, even if you're if even if you if, if you're P and G, um, you know, it used to be uh, you ran your marketing. You had television commercials, outdoor magazines, radio. That was it. In the beginning, you could say social media, and you think of it as oh, that's one category, right? That, but now that's an ever you know, growing, changing list of of things. You're doing employment marketing on LinkedIn and you've got your, you know, more visual marketing on Instagram. We need our videos and our creators on TikTok and we need our influencers. And so it's not even a problem that's solved by money, but it's particularly difficult for the entrepreneur and the startup where you have limited time, limited money, lots of jobs to do. You wear a lot of hats. And what do you do about it? What I say is it's so easy to get in this position where you're working in the business, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, trying to solve it with volume. And it's like the ocean. You can't solve it with volume. Okay. It wins. It's just bigger than you are. The waves are going to get you. What you need to do is time box. You spend some time working in it. But when that time is done, you stop and you get back on the beach. And in my grand ocean metaphor, the beach is solid ground. It's strategy. It's thinking about the business and go to the fundamentals. What are you really selling? What is the experience that you're offering through your product or or, uh, service? What's different about it how should somebody feel? What's your what's unique about your brand? What is your strategic advantage here? Because when you are building strategic advantage, either better name, I mean, it should be all of these things, better product, better name, better brand, better message, you know, better connection. If you don't have something to build on, then you're trying to do it dollar for dollar, minute for minute. And guess what? You don't have more dollars and you don't have more minutes. You need a better idea. So spend your time focusing on having the better idea and then people will come to you. I like that. And the one thing that has been circling my mind lately is going completely out of the box and thinking more around the gift economy 
What Mm -hmm. are those things that we can do? Obviously, if you have hard goods, packaged product, you can't just go around giving it all away. But what are these things? How can we add value to our audience and to our community where we're saying, okay, this is donation-based. If Mm. you think that you got $10, $20, $30 worth of value out of the message that I've given you and you're walking away with something you can do something with, I almost feel like I can make more money doing it that way than saying, attend this event for $150, spend four hours with me, and then you have a smaller number of people because they feel hamstrung by a price tag versus feeling inspired to give you money because you have given them value. See, great marketing idea. You can look at, at, at gift economy and, you know, there's all the literal level, you know, of when people feel that value has been given to them. They have uh, Cialdini who wrote Persuasion said, wait, child, is it influence or persuasion? I don't know. I think it's, we have to look that up. But um, anyway, he's the, he's the University of Arizona professor who's an, an expert in persuasiveness. And, you know, one of his principles, and he only has a few, is the principle of reciprocation, whereas people have a compulsion to reciprocate when they feel you've given them real value. My belief is that marketing, even advertising, works best as a gift. When Nike uh, speaks to you like an athlete and tells you to just do it, if you're in their target audience, it feels like a gift to you. It's a conceptual gift. It's an emotional gift. Um, But you feel grateful and you want to give back. And the truth is you're choosing between, you know, athletic shoes and it could be like, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. They, they all look good to me. I'm going to give Nike, give back to Nike. I feel loyal to them. Um, and so Nike benefits. It's, it's kind of that simple. So I, I think the reason I, I go for a sort of conceptual gift is because when you do your marketing communications, your advertising, you know, when you do do your social posts, it doesn't cost any more to do one that feels like a gift than it does to do one that just feels like an ad or just feels like an irrelevant message. Right. Um, And it also feels like when you do it that way, that's the quality over quantity debacle that everyone gets in, especially in cannabis where when I see somebody that's posted five or six things a day and none of them give me what you were just talking about, then you're just noise to me and I need to hide you. I, I think that's exactly right. It, it's, you know, I have empathy and sympathy for folks who get into that rhythm because you're like, I got to do it. I got to do it. And, and, and they get into this cycle, but again, back on the beach, back on solid ground, a little time spent thinking about who is my audience? What value can I bring to them? How can my message stand out and not just, stand out bragging about what's different about my product, but how can it be a service to them? How can it make them feel better? How can it, you know, if the goal is to, to achieve a high, how do I improve the high? If the goal is to show up as a better, more connected person in in life, how can I add to that through my message? So, you know, how can it align with, how can product and your messaging combine into one thing that feels like a whole that really helps people that really elevates your audience. One of the things in harmony with that is, okay, working backwards from my users and experience, and then how do I get there? So instead of saying, this is the message I want to shove down your throat, it's what is that little nugget of knowledge that you want to consume and how can I get there and working that backwards? Yeah, you're, we connect easily on this because we're communications thinkers who got here, but we started from communications thinking, from marketing thinking. And so it's, it's natural for us 
to start not with ourselves, but with the audience, right? With, and to think backwards from them. And, and, you know, I think there are a lot of people get into business and they're thinking from the other direction. I can get the product. I can market the product. I just run ads. I'm, I'm living on my beach and I just run ads and people are buying my stuff. And so I think what we're doing is we're inviting them to say, okay, but if you want that to work, you've got to start from the other end, start from the receiver of your communication and figure out it, how it's going to look and feel and be motivating from their point of view. That's and, communication thinking, and it should inform everything you do because you're for them. You're building a company for them. That's what makes you rich <laughs> Okay, when the company yeah. is built for them and it really serves them. Yes. And with so much brand overload, one of the things that if you're an established brand and you already have all your social handles and your website and all of your stuff done and there's no changing it, okay, fine. But if you are new and you are starting all these things out, you know, one of the most important things is making sure you have consistency across all of your platforms and your names and, you know, your social handles and like all of that, that's that low hanging fruit of what's going to make someone want to stick with me, find me if, you know, for me, I'm at Casually Baked. It doesn't matter if you're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, The Weed Tube, Truth Social. The only thing you need to remember is Casually Baked. And there's so many times where I'm trying to follow a brand and try to find them on one handle and then they have a different handle on another platform. And that stuff drives the end user crazy. Amen. You know, I, I, when we were talking a couple of weeks ago, I was loving on your, on your handle casually baked and how you found something it's, uh, that people just want to say, right. And that is, it's so it's evocative and it's unique and it's ownable and you've been able to be consistent. And I can tell you that for me, the most tragic, you know, category, and by the way, also most common category of prospective clients that I've turned away uh, in my career are folks who just don't have the right name and they can't change it now, you know? And so like Google is always going to be search.com because search.com is just so generic that ironically, no one's going to be able to find it. Generic doesn't work. Google doesn't sound like it doesn't mean anything. It's but it's different and it's two syllables and it's easy to say. Um, well, you know, and, Amazon's but, always going to be books.com. Right. Well, and you saying that, like Google, that became a word that became yeah. part of our lexicon. Yeah. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. But people tend to think the other way. They tend to think, oh my gosh, how am I going to teach? You know, how is anybody going to remember casually baked? Maybe I, sh maybe it should just be the marijuana cast or the <laughs> canna cast or whatever, you know, but you know how many of those there will be? It's the unique evocative name where that you bring meaning to that really matters. And it's a hard thing to solve later. You know, it's, it's, you, it, companies get into difficult uh, problems, even though I've been I, I, I hate to say it, but I but I'll say it. And I'm sometimes brilliant in helping clients solve these naming and naming architecture problems and all of that. Um, you know, my own company, I started it. I, I named it after myself, uh, Demassimo. It was uh, Demassimo Inc. And then it became Demassimo Brand Advertising. And then my young partner, uh, Lee Goldstein, grew and we called it Demassimo Goldstein. I said, oh, we've got a naming problem now because Damasimo Goldstein is five syllables and people won't say five syllables. And we don't want them to call us D and G because there are a thousand D and G's and we'll just become invisible. So um, let's get folks to call us Digo. Uh, we'll, we'll just have our own nickname. Well, it's co complicated now because now some people are calling us Damasimo and we're Damasimo Goldstein, but we're also Digo. And then we own DigoBrands.com because we couldn't own Digo. And we also own Damasimo.com, but I didn't want to do that to Goldstein. And, and so what's our handle? Is it Digo? Is it Digo Brands? Is it Damasimo Goldstein? So, you know, folks might say, well, why would you, why would you tell this story about yourself in, in this context? I don't want to hold up myself out as, 
as perfect because I want you to know if you if you're imperfect, you can succeed. And that sometimes it's easy, easier to get into problems than it is to solve them in the beginning. So you'll never get into them. If I were to go all the way back to, you know, if I knew 26 years ago when I started my business, what I knew now, um, I would have done it differently then. Yeah. Now it's actually really hard to make the change for me. And I, my feeling is, well, my clients are more important than I am. And they're the one that I already have enough. Um, but, but still, it's easy to get into a problem. Solve it first. Solve your name right at the beginning. And so someone who is, you know, trying to solve the naming dilemma, I had heard a business name that ends with that hard K, like baked. Yeah. Is easier to remember. Are there little things like that, those nuances that help somebody come up with a creative name? Well, sure. Look, there there are there are quite a few. I mean, I'll start with the ones, you know, just that that work sort of generally. First off, easy to hear, easy to say, easy to read. Um, ideally, in that order, easy to hear, easy to read, easy to say. So generally. That means that four syllables is the maximum that people will say. Um, anything longer than four syllables, um, folks will find a shorthand, ultimately. So Federal Express was five syllables and it was FedEx. American Express, American, was six syllables. It became Amex. Um, and you might not like the way they abbreviate your name. So go for, if you can, you know, short uh, and punchy, short and punchy, short and punchy, um, especially if you need that's if you need people to say it again, and again, you know, Goldman and Sachs four syllables, um, you know, casually baked. It's, it's a I mouthful. Think people, I think the way people <laughs> pronounce it, it's five. So it's four syllables casually baked. It's like casually it is. You could say it's four syllables, but most people pronounce it as three. You know, yeah. in the deep south, it's seven. Yeah, exactly. Uh, in, in New York, it's two. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I, I think the rhythm makes people want to say it. I feel like it, it's in the mouth. It's like four syllables, casually baked. And, and it, it's bump, 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 bump. So the rhythm, so the baked at the end gives people that satisfying ending. So I was a musician before I was ever an ad guy. So rhythm is, I, I find, really, really important to think about. It's something people want to say, and they, they delight in saying it. People do like, you know, that whole dun da 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 You know, <laughs> that people want yes. that ending. So yes. you've got that there. So there's syllables. There's rhythms. Um, there's, you know, easy to read. You have to think about your trading area. If you're going to be global or international, you know, one thing I liked about Digo, it means I say in Spanish, you know, we say things for people. So I like that, even though I'm not Spanish, um, the, the pronunciation that we bring to it is more international. Uh, Digo, I, you know, if we were in Italy or Japan, people would, would say it right. Where my parents live in Virginia, they're likely to say Digo because, you know, Rio Road there is Rio Road in Virginia. Got it. Mm -hmm. So some people will need to be educated, but but most of the world would just automatically say it right and read it and it's two syllables. So those are the most important things. After that, it's just how do you want people to feel about it? So letters like S and I and A are associated with beautiful names. You know, um, uh, a name like uh, Marissa, if, if people didn't know the meaning, if you went to a culture where people had never met a Marissa, People will say it's wired into us. That's a pretty word because mm -hmm. it's I's and S's and A's. Um, names with hard letters are considered a little more yang, a little more, you know, hard. Mm -hmm. And that, but that can be good for, for certain things. What's nice about casually baked is that casually is a very chill, soft word and baked is a hard word. So Again, that that rhythm, the way they come together is pleasing to people. And so thinking about those things is important too. Yeah, I like that. This is fun doing this brainstorm style. Because one of the things that I find so much is that people want to get so creative and crafty with their naming 
that it's not easy to read or easy to say, you know, like where people like to pull all of the vowels out of words and just, yes. you know, because our, yes. our eyes can read it. But then sure. when I go to type it in and look for you in a search engine, it's going to make it very challenging for me to find you because I don't know how to spell the name of your business. Yeah, you know, and I, I think I think one thing that's led to that to that trend is trademarks used to be country by country and category by category. But the internet changed the law, which changed all of that. Now we compete with everybody in the world for names, and there are there are fewer and fewer names available. Can we hard. hit pause for one second? Sure. So I went to Squadcast today to get this stuff situated. And I was having problems logging into my account. And so I go to their customer support and I'm like, I have an account. I can't get in. And I get a response saying, you're at squadcast.com. We are at this. You need uh, to go to squadcast.fm. And I oh, was like, wow. I'm an idiot. Thank you very much. But, but are like- you or are you or should I mean, or it's, I mean, what a crazy world where we haven't figured out how to make it easy to just get to our, to the right place, right. To just go like, you knew what you knew what you wanted, but, but this is the thing, like you have to get to any place in the world with an address. Mm -hmm. That's all you get. Like, yeah. And for whatever reason, squadcast, you know, .com populated before .fm. And so then you, now you're competing with a completely different industry. Yeah. And, and by the way, squadcast.com, if they have the squadcast name trademark, they could sue and say there and say there's confusion because we operate in the same channels, the internet, the same channel, and they could win if those facts are, are so, but I don't, hopefully none of them are watching this podcast. Yeah, I know. (laughs) There was your squadcast sponsorship that you were hoping for. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. So you do something in your industry and with your clients where you call it positive behavior change marketing. And with us being in an industry that is heavily regulated, and of course that has years and years and years of stigma built into it, we are already fighting that battle of just trying to get to the starting line to be with all the other brands, we have to jump like 10 hurdles to get to the starting line. So I'd love to talk about, you know, the micro behavior changes that we're seeing happen and that, you know, how we can use that as cannabis brands, hemp brands, people that are in this kind of uh, fringe area of the marketing world. Uh, you know, great question. And like you, I geek out on my, on my industry. And I know like you're like a vertically integrated person in your industry, you know, it all the way from the farm, you know, through the, the nervous systems of the, of of the customers, (laughs) you really do. Uh, uh, and the marketing included, and I'm the same way about what I call positive behavior change, marketing and brand building. You know, so it's not just a slogan with us where, you know, we're the world's leading positive behavior change agency. And I really am trying to build a positive behavior change movement in branding and and marketing. It's a day and night, joyful self-education process. And, you know, um, like just today, I did calls with clients trying to change the the pet food industry, uh, organic ingredients, you know, real ingredients that you can see and all of that. Uh, I was also on a call with psychology professors, neuroscientists, and young game designers working on games that promote meditation and pro-social behavior. Um, you know, so so that's my life. So it's positive positive behavior change. The thing with with change is that you know you're usually on the out when at the beginning. You know, it's there's usually skepticism at the beginning. One of my psychology PhD advisors um, was the first uh, president, founding president of the Energy Psychology Association. It's called something different, but it's for energy psychologists. And you know, they sort of integrate uh, some acupressure stuff into psychology. 
which when it first came out, you know, 20, 25 years ago, um, the whole, you know, academic thrust of psychology said, this is BS, this is crazy Eastern stuff and isn't real medicine. Um, and now there are hundreds of studies um, supporting the efficacy of this stuff, and they are accepted. And, you know, it grew even while the industry was against it, it grew because it was working for people. Right. So change, you know, change goes through stages. So I would say you're right where you ought to be. It's actually really fun to be the challenger. You know, it's, it, it actually, it's an adjustment when suddenly you're accepted and part of the establishment. So let's not rush it. Um, yeah. And there's a price to be paid sometimes too, when they start to regulate you because, because you're accepted. So, so one, go slow. Two, let's take advantage of this. Like be proud about your message and be real. Like not all cannabis cons consumption is positive behavior change. Um, you know, just like, just like not all exercise is positive behavior change. There are exercise addicts killing themselves out there. There are. Yeah. You know, there are, there are people who are using ex exercise as a, com as a compulsion, you know, as part of their bulimia or anorexia or whatever. Does that make e exercise a bad thing? Absolutely not. On the whole, when, you know, when part of a positive habit, exercise extends your life and makes things better. And, you know, so, so you can't paint um, a product as complex and multifaceted as cannabis based on, you know, how some users use it, how some marketers have marketed it. Um, and I do think the more we're thinking about the effect on people's behaviors and their lives, and we're making sure that we're managing to be a positive impact on people's behaviors and their lives. So not just thinking, am I selling it or am I not? But what's the effect the more we're taking responsibility for that, the more we're helping this whole industry become a positive force and, and fulfill its potential as a positive force. And the more we're a positive force, the bigger we'll be. I think I was telling you last time, and I'm going to interrupt your question, I guess, but I was telling you last time, we do a whole positive behavior change index study. It's quantitative and it's qualitative. It's been going on for two years. And what we found is that Industries and companies that have a positive effect on people's lives through their behaviors are rewarded in the marketplace and they grow. And when people start to feel that you're a negative effect on my behavior or on my community or on my family, they punish you. They make it harder for you to grow. So social media, like Facebook right now, it needs to actually improve its positive behavior change score. And they're trying to work on it because they're actually being hurt by this, the reputation they've gained for not being good for us. Right. And of course, their way of fixing it is like, okay, how can we sneak in new algorithms and like change shit? They're not trying to do it on the up and up. Let's be real. But that <laughs> is, not. but this is exactly the point though, is when you have an advertiser and you're just trying to say, we're the number one this, or this is the best website to go to for this. I'm just like, shut up. Like, what? what's in it for me? What are you here to give to me? And, you know, with cannabis going from illegal to either medically legal or adult use legal, those are like little baby step conversations to have. And, you know, using our marketing to, I like to say, edutain people because everybody that is finished with school doesn't want to go back to school. So how can I entertain you and educate you at the same time? And so making positive. sure that we are almost like, you know, we're taking a little journey, each little marketing piece. I'm teaching you something. I'm giving you another breadcrumb to guide you out of this BS that we've been told for years and years and years that cannabis is terrible and it's a gateway drug to all these other things. You can't just one day say, we're the number one cannabis brand in the United States. It's like, there's so much education to happen between point A and that finish line. Amen. You know, just, it's go going back to that, you know, that orientation of starting where they are and taking them to, to us 
you know, I do think there, you know, I'll, the mindset of a lot of folks is if I want people to think that I'm the, that we're the number one, uh, that's what I have to say. But the truth is you get to be number one by leading people to you and you take them step by step. And yeah, for me, the difference between edutainment or even just effective marketing and education, which you're right, people want to be done with is it feels easy and enjoyable each step of the way. And I feel, you know, I feel better for it. So just take me on a step, teach me something I don't know. You know, I, I think of the, um, uh, what's that, what's the mushroom movie that that's on uh, Netflix now? Um, um, I, I, anyway, I've watched it twice. Um, I've watched it twice too. And I forget as well too. And I'm sorry, but, um, but go to Netflix, search mushrooms, you'll find it. Um, but I mean, you feel like you learn so much. You feel like you're, I mean, maybe you don't because you may, you probably know the world better than I do. But when I first saw it, I was like, wow, this whole community and look at these smart people and what they figured out. And, you know, um, this ecosystem that includes us and mushrooms and how we're already. Yes. And didn't, that's exactly the point. When you learn about the mycelium network and you're like, whoa, like there's so much that happens in our 3d world that is mimicking nature, you know, like us having the world wide web. Right. Fungi have been doing that forever. Right. They've got a world wide web. (laughs) Yes. And so like for me watching that movie made me feel more connected to nature and, and human beings. Like we are all one system. We are all one thing. And so if you can make that kind of an impact with someone through your marketing, you don't have to say you're number one. They feel it. They feel that you are for them. That's right. And who's, who's more likely to, to open up their mind and entertain a a new thought or even changing their mind, someone who feels they're being marketed to or someone who's been elevated and ha- and has suddenly has this feeling of being connected to all of life. You know, I'm going to go with that second category. I think that's the environment in which people have their mind expanded and, and, and learn new things. And you saying that brings me back to a note that I wrote when we first talked about learning from behavior change influencers. So yeah. if you do identify someone who maybe was you know, on this side of the fence and they have a huge following and they've seen the light, so to speak, you know, figuring out ways you can collaborate with those people, someone who has a bigger megaphone, but that believes in your message, finding people that you can create content together and just kind of elevate each other. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. What you said is already, is, is already right. So the only thing I could say to add value is look for the authentic connection. A lot of times people want the, you know, the polished, you know, want a celebrity rather than somebody who might have a a few edges, but is, is real and authentic. When you think about this whole world, uh, 50 years ago, wasn't lifting weights, doing aerobics, running, joining gyms, you know, there wouldn't be, a, you know, a Peloton. No one would spend that kind of money. You know, there were exercise bikes, weirdos bought them and they became coat racks. Like they, you know, they didn't even, they didn't even make them so that they could survive being used because that they weren't used. Um, so the whole world was changed and it was changed by wonderful weirdos. You know, people who baked sneakers in their own basements Um you know, Jack LaLanne, like who was like towing, towing ships in a harbor with his teeth, you know, um, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, so on the beach. It wasn't it wasn't like a bunch of people who got together and say, say we're the best and hire a celebrity. <laughs> That's not who changed the whole world. And now the whole world is into fitness. Yeah. I mean, it's that whole monkey see, monkey do thing. And social media has completely changed how we not only look at ourselves, how we present ourselves. I mean, 
there are a lot of people that really lean into their digital identity and have completely just like crapped out at life. But if you look <laughs> at them online, they're the bee's knees, but you they haven't seen their friends in months. They only communicate through text message and Instagram. And it, it's insane. And so for me, I have really been pulling back from social media and spending more time having conversations like this with you that I enjoy and figuring out ways that I can get involved in my community with real people and put my hands in real dirt. Like the metaverse can fuck off as far as I'm concerned, you know? <laughs> hey, that's a t-shirt. Put that on a t-shirt. The metaverse can fuck off. Um, hey, look, I, I'm, I'm totally with you. I, I just think there's getting more attention and there's adding more value. And, you know, I'm in the business of getting attention for things. That means, you know, it, in my life, I've worked with stars. I've worked with social media influencers and stars and all of that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a total life commitment. If you're not all about that to the core, only in the rarest case are you going to be that. And some people are all about that to the core and God bless them, the world, we need them. You know, we need divas, we need social media stars. But, you know, if you're not that, you don't have to try to be that or compete with that. Add value, find your way to add value and you can do it, you can do it. You know, you saying that to me is what my saying of get paid to be yourself. Get paid to be yourself, yeah. So just really dial in who you are. What are your values? What do you add that nobody else does? And just do that every day over and over and over and over and over again. Because so much people are like, well, I think what people want is this. And they zip that suit on and they try it out for a couple of months. And then it's like, mm, well, that's not getting the engagement that I want. So they take that suit off and try on another one. And now they're two or three years in and there's no consistency in their brand whatsoever. Yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. I, I just can imagine somebody listening and, and thinking, well, but myself is, I like to, you know, have a case of beer uh, on hand and play video games and then fall asleep with my nose on the thing. So how am I going to make money doing that? I, I think folks have to find work. That's them. You know, my mom said, I, you know, no offense, Mark. I, I love your success and all of that. But you're, when you were a teenager, your dad and I would have voted you most likely to sit on the couch your whole life, you know, cause that's, <laughs> that, that's who I was when I was a teenager, you know, <laughs> like, um, uh, but well, you know, we've created I, that issue though now with you know the the Gen Z crowd where they they have found ways to not leave their couch and yeah, to look at yeah. a screen and to make money and you know there's a, a a real entitledness to how they show up in the business world of like well this is who I am pay me a lot of money and then I'll do the work, not like I'm willing to get in there, put in the sweat equity, like show you my value and then get paid accordingly. It's like they want it done the opposite way. Yeah. Well, look, I think unless they're going to private schools or whatever, the first <laughs> 18 years or so, they're basically told what to do and no one's really asking what you want to do. Or, or And then they're marketed to, if they go to college, they're marketed to. And like we, we, we put up a, we got a hot tub for you. Come to our school. There's a hot tub right outside your dorm room. <laughs> and they're not given realistic expectations of the working world. And right now, folks are emerging into this incredibly hot employment economy, which is going to cool off, if not next month, eventually. There could be a rude a awakening. And I don't think it's their fault at all. I, I think it's, you know, it's the, it's in a sense the way the system is, has, has prepared them and hopefully... Uh, you know, hopefully we can we can get to as many as possible and help them 
But I, I think if you love something, you're willing to invest in it and commit in it. And like people are listening to you because of who you are. And somehow you got raised an authentic person and you're pursuing your own authentic vision. Um, and yeah, it's rare. A lot of people are like, a lot of people have to have to learn how to find that within themselves. They've never, it's never been encouraged and they've never been taught. Well, so, and it wasn't, I can't, I can't say that it was encouraged and taught for me to do this, but this was just something that I continuously drop myself into strange places, have interesting experiences where I can develop this. Like there is a, a lot of discomfort in becoming who you are. It's not comfortable all the time learning what your value set is or what you have to offer or the things that you find interesting to learn. Like it takes effort. And I think so much of these young people, I mean, we're talking about people whose lives have been put on line their whole lives yeah. Yeah. from the time they're born, their virtual lives to them seem to have more value than their off screen lives. Oh, I, I think you're sadly right. I mean, I, you know, I, I see it cause I got, I got windows into these, into these kids. And I think they're in some cases they are, their offline lives are, completely undeveloped. They're trying to form their identities based on, you know, what avatars they, they like playing as in games. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm like, I'm all for anybody being whoever they are, but go out into the world and figure out what your identity is in the world. Yeah. Without <laughs> that special filter. Yeah. You without know? That special filter, go out and yeah, you know, you be whoever you want to be, but go out in the world and be that person. And then see how that goes and see if that feels right to you. Um, and that is us saying this and having this conversation takes me back to then these are the, our future marketers. And if yeah. these people have shitty social skills, how are we going to expect them to put together these meaningful messages for people when they don't know how to communicate and connect? Yeah. And look, some of them, you know, the thing about connecting through media, it's also a game. And there are folks out there, uh, this is not true of everybody, but I would say a, a higher than normal percentage of the social media all-stars who I have known personally as well are not people who you'd want to spend most of your time with at a party. <laughs> they're, you know, they're, they're, compulsively succeeding in social, you know, get it out, get attention, do the right things. And that intense social ambition, at least for me, makes them really annoying in person, you know? <laughs> so, so there are probably are going to be marketers who can play these games really well, who can, you know, do the TikTok like nobody's business but it doesn't make them well-rounded people. And I don't think they're going to become founders of the organizations that are going to change our world for the better because they're, because they're, they may serve those people. Right. But, yeah. but if they're not whole, they're not going to be able to create a whole. Yeah. Yeah. This is a true story. It's funny. I've been trying to have a conversation with someone and they are like, they're in the moment taking um, selfies to post or to go live. And I just like, let's put our phones up. I just want to be present. And, you know, there's no such thing as putting your phone up when you're that person. Yeah. You know, one thing about this whole category is I think this is subtle for a lot of people and lost in this world. We're always in a device and all of that, that where it, we orient people toward their feeling state toward the type of consciousness they're experiencing at a given time toward where their attention is going. And that feels like something that is sadly missing in this noisy, hyper-connected world being that's how are you right now? What are you focused on right now? Let's just focus on each other right now. And the ability to do that, um, Hopefully, we're going to create a less lonely world for people who are capable of being present. Mm -hmm. Because I do think it's become, 
it's become a, at least intermittently lonely world for people who are capable of being present because when you're present, you realize others aren't. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's discouraging. It's a, it's another way that it's lonely at the top, you know? <laughs> yeah. You know, I see a lot of the farmers in the cannabis space doing such a great job of pulling back the curtain of what it's like to be on the farm and what it means to be a regenerative farmer and mm. what that means to the land and what that means to our food. And then to our bodies. And, and so they're painting this really beautiful picture that tells you, wow, now I know why I want farm cut cannabis. Now I know why I want sun and earth certified cannabis versus something that was grown in a grow house. And so I see people doing that in the right way. But then on the other side of that, I still see an overwhelming number of posts and ads that's just hot babes smoking blunts or bongs and blowing smoke in your face in a bikini. There's got to be a way for us as mainstream cannabis brands to be responsible and be more of those mainstream values, putting those into play. I feel like there's enough traction within cannabis. The majority of the country believes that it's got medical value and should be legalized. So instead of it just being like weed porn, you know, growing up, growing up our marketing efforts, growing up our advertising and branding efforts. So what advice do you have for just cannabis brands to just step their game up a little bit? Well, first off, I've worked in the food category and online grocery and grocery. And one of our latest client wins is in, in sort of in the quality food food products area. Um, and you're, you're exactly right. I, I, I love the development that's happened just really in the last decade of, of the way farmers and, and food producers too uh, have, have been able to tell their, their stories. There's a confidence, you know, there's, there, people get a little too strategic sometimes as marketers. They, they, people don't want to hear our story. People just want to hear what they want to hear. They don't want to know. I, I think if you have people want authentic stories, people also say, well, people don't want my story because my story isn't their story. And therefore my, no, people like authentic, idiosyncratic, real stories. And yes, I want to know where it comes from. And I want to know everything about it. Like, I, enrich it for me. Look what's what's become of the wine category. You know, this was just like, it was sour grapes at one point. That was the wine category was just like, well, what do we do with those grapes that, we that you know, we didn't eat? <laughs> you know, that was it long ago. And the stories have made it into a luxury product and a lifestyle. I had an uncle and he was in the silicon chip business and he moved to London and he was on the London wine tasting team and he had a wine cellar and, you know, wine was this huge part of his life. And, you know, the, all it all matters. What's in the soil? How does that come through? What I'm getting at here is, is a way to win your category is to learn from other categories that are further developed. Over time, competition gets tougher and tougher. And so look at what wine is doing. Look at what uh, seafood is doing. Look at these other categories and take a couple of steps ahead of where everybody else is. So often we all, you said monkey see, monkey do. So often we all just look at what everybody in our category is doing. And every, every meeting you go into, whatever the leading, like who's a leading brand in cannabis now, whatever, you know. Well, I mean, it depends on what state you're in or what region, all, all right. you know. Yeah. So let's say casually baked. Let, yes, let's, that's, think, so let's do every that. Every meeting you go in, it's like, why can't we be like casually baked? And casually baked does it this way and all of that. And that's all good. But if you're not spending more than half your time learning from brands outside your category. Like I'd rather go into a meeting where it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Casually baked. We all know that we love them. It's inspiring. We all listen. Let's talk about what we can learn from Porsche 
the economist, you know, Ernest and Julio Gallo right now. <laughs> you know, yeah. let's learn outside our category because we might actually beat our category that way. Yes, I like that idea because there is so much synergy between cannabis and wine, especially here in California. And, you know, it is extremely clear that the terroir matters, the growing styles matter, the varietals matter, you know, we know all of that. So choosing two or three of your favorite wine brands, what are they doing? What do you love about what they're doing? Yeah. Or, you know, the, or the accessories, your brand brand neighborhood, right? So I want people who, whose go-to, these are their go-to wines. I want to be their go-to cannabis brand. That makes a lot of sense. And even, you know, when we're talking about um, outside of just touching cannabis, we call them ancillary cannabis brands, which is what casually baked would be considered. What are the ancillary wine brands doing, yeah. you know, being able to look at all of these other things. What is that lifestyle story that they tell? You know, how am I going to feel after I have this experience? How am I going to feel during this experience? Like all of those things get you a lot more revved up to actually have the experience. That's the, I, yes, yes. Foreplay. What are you saying that is enriching the the experience. Um, you know, we I, I, we worked with uh, Ted Wade, who was the founder of of uh, Gateway. Um, you know, back in the day, and Gateway was competing with Dell and seventy five hundred other direct to consumer startups, and everybody had the same idea at the same time. Oh my God, I can get components. I can run an ad. I can sell these things. Um, and so, literally, everybody was in this business. It was like cannabis is now a gold rush, everybody trying to get into it. Um, you know, and Ted basically said, I don't want to just sell this to people who already love technology. I don't want to just sell this to men. And I really want as many people to trust us as possible. So I'm going to sell at a price point that, you know, I, there will be no friends and family because everybody's friends and family. That's how low the price point is going to be. As long as I'm in charge of this company. And I'm going to make it accessible. So he put the cow spots on the box. So you'd go down a, down a street and you'd see all these boxes piled up. And here would be these, these boxes with cow spots on them. And it, it became great advertising. So, yeah, what can you learn? What can you learn from folks outside the category that helps you stand out? Yeah, that's the million dollar question. So what advice do you have for someone who is on a super small team or, you know, like their marketing department is one person, you know, what are those little things that we can do that can make a a grander impact? Yeah. So let's say I was the one person marketing team at a, at a startup or at a small place. I would sit down with the founder of the founding team. Hopefully if you're that small, there's a founder around if there's not, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> Sit down with your founder or your founder around. Your founder, uh, so many people feel like they they want their own space and their own autonomy and like keep, you know, keep the boss. Uh, if you're in a small place and you're thinking that way, it's crazy. Leverage your founder. Your founder works for you. So just stop thinking that you lose t- autonomy when you spend time with your founder. If you've got a good founder who, who had an idea, you want to leverage that person, go spend time with that person, and you want to ask these questions. One, forget what's possible right now. Forget we're small. What's the biggest possibility for what we're doing? What could we be? What change could we make in the world? You know, what's your dream? I want to know what it is. So start from possibility because so often we limit ourselves before we've even begun. And you've got it. So take feasibility, what can be done, put it off the table, start with possibilities. You know, Ben and Jerry, who I suspect benefited from this product, even when it wasn't legal, they didn't sit around saying, oh, my God, how, how are we going to compete with uh, these massive ice cream companies, haagen and, and and all of that? They basically said, you know, I think there's a lot of room for the kind of ice cream that people would mix at home 
if they had the munchies, you know? I think there's a lot of room for that. I think there's a market for that. I think there's a place for us. And I think there's a place for a brand that has a social mission, not just a product as well, too. So they saw that possibility. Yvonne Ch- Chouinard at Patagonia, you know, basically said, I know we're, we're small. We're like the P. We're not the princess and we're not the whole bed. We're the, we're the P. But I believe that there are a lot of people out there who explore the planet and come to love it and would rather buy their stuff from a company that, that feels and acts the same way. So what's the possibility? Find it for your company. And then I think, then, then say, if we achieve nothing else in the next, I'd start with a year, then I go down to six months, then I go to 90 days, then I go to month. But if we achieve nothing else in the next X to move toward that goal, what's the most important thing? And get on the same page about that. And then you just go and get it, go and do it. And then do this, do it all again. I like that a lot. And you touched on the social component, which I think is such low hanging fruit. You know, if you know who you are as a brand and you're not engaging in some sort of a social mission, then that's another place to start. That's something to do because the world is not getting less crazy. The market is not getting less congested with brands. So that's one of those things. If you feel passionate about something and there's a social mission, then when you are going through all of these efforts, at least you're going to feel good as a human doing it. And then you're going to connect with other people that are on board with your mission. And so, yeah, that social component, I think, is really crucial. Yeah, you know, it's 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 funny. There are so many ways that this that this goes wrong. A lot of it has to do with the with the values and character of the people who are involved. Because you spoke eloquently about meeting people where they are and taking them on steps. And you also talked about mission and social values. But because you know the hierarchy of those values for you. Because when you make decisions, you're able to say, for example, you know, this might not work out economically this time, or I may not make money on it this time, but I feel good about what I'm doing. So I'm going to try it. In a sense, the character shows and you have to be not everything. It's certainly possible that it might not have worked out for Ben, Jerry, or Yvonne Chenard. It might not have but they felt good about what they were doing and it was authentically them. And so they stuck with it. And resilience is one of the most important things. Everybody's going to make mistakes. Everybody's going to have failures. So you've got to, I always, I basically say, if you don't love it, if you don't love it and you don't love doing it and you can't feel good about being the person who does it, you're not going to stick with it. And if you can't stick with a thing, it's not going to be a success. Yeah. A thousand percent. And I have been told numerous times that I don't think big enough with my own brand. So when you're saying, you know, like, what are these possibilities? I find myself being hamstrung by, well, it's just me and I don't have a shit ton of money right now to spend. And so I do find myself limiting my own possibilities. And so I know I'm not the only one doing that. I think that's important um, to get us inspired. Like, you know, throw everything out the window that you already know. We can know ourselves to death. (laughs) And so just like forget everything you know and just like daydream, get excited, you know, brainstorm, get people that are as excited about who you are as what you want to create. And then, you know, that momentum of having that many people, that amount of energy buzzing together, wonderful things come out of that always. Yeah. You know, I've got ideas for you on how you can take that to the next level, honestly, because I think you're, it's been said a lot, but, but, but it's been said a lot because it's true that there are no overnight successes. So sure. People are going to say like, oh, you're not thinking big enough and you're still focused on the soil and the farmers and the market and you're spending all your... 
but you're what you're doing is you're planting the seeds for something that can grow much bigger and 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 you're growing the roots that can sustain something much bigger that's what i see you doing i do feel like you've made some uh and is it okay if i talk about casually baked on casually baked yeah i feel certainly. like you've made some startlingly great brand decisions so i do think that there is great potential for your brand in terms of intellectual property assets in terms of brand assets in terms terms of network assets that you've created um, and just in terms of your knowledge base in this category you've built something really rich what you don't have is massive investment money manufacturing distribution and all of that and you know part of me just thinks that that when you're ready getting into a trustworthy sort of networking organization that is beyond your industry, but where people can say, oh my God, this is what an amazing founder and brand in a space I want to get into. I can get you funding. I can get you manufacturing. I can, would you license the brand name for something if you could have quality control over the product and the marketing and all of that? I feel like it's meeting the right people and you probably don't only have to meet three, but it's where do you go to meet those people? But you've been getting ready for that. And I, I think people underestimate what it really takes to, to be ready for that. You've been doing it. That's, that's my honest opinion. Thank you. I was just talking to my sister saying, we're getting ready to get ready. Like that's constantly the state that you feel like you're in as an entrepreneur or a small business owner, you constantly are getting ready to get ready for the next thing. And so, you know, it is finding all of those stars aligning and the, the right connections being made. And then poof, you're the overnight success that just happened to be doing it for seven years. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, yep, we should talk more about that. <laughs> All right, let's do it. So do you have any book recommendations, websites, homework that you might tell somebody to dive into to uh, sharpen their teeth, their marketing teeth? Yeah, there's a book I love. I didn't write it. Uh, it's uh, written by a guy named Marty uh, Newmeyer that I think is just great. At, if you read only one book, read Zag by Marty Newmeyer. It's a really efficient, easy book to read, and it'll tell you how to build a different brand. So the kinds of decisions that I mentioned Ben and Jerry, you know, that Patagonia made, that Airbnb made, he takes you through exactly how to make those decisions. And I'm a big fan. He teaches branding workshops around the world, and he's a, he's a partner in a, in a branding agency. And even though I suppose they're competitors, I like, it, I like his stuff so much, I'm happy to to recommend uh, what he's written. Uh, beyond that, I would just say I'm Mark DeMassimo. Uh, you know, connect with me on on LinkedIn or follow me on LinkedIn. I'm happy to do it. And I I post stuff all the time, stuff to read, um, people to be inspired by, cases to learn. I'm wanting to help folks who want to do good things for people through for-profit businesses. I'm here to to just to help all I can. Well, I appreciate that. Now, I was getting ready to wrap up, and then I just had a thought about affiliate marketing. And I think that that's such an important component for cannabis brands because, you know, you aren't getting a lot of traction on social media. And so I think affiliate marketing is something that is important to look into and like a place to gain some traction I know that for me, it's been wonderful as a podcaster to find a brand that I like and appreciate and then being able to be a voice for their brand and and make a small commission off of, of the sales that I generate for them. So thinking about that from either being the affiliate or being a brand that is reaching out. So do you have any thoughts on affiliate marketing? Yeah, look, from the advertising agency guy guy's point of view, you know, affiliate marketing, like influencer marketing, like search engine marketing, it's all under the category of media channels. The whole idea of buying media is based on the premise that there are people who are better than you are at 
at entertaining and, and aggregating an audience that you want to be in front of. And what affiliate marketing allows you to do is only pay when you're getting, you know, leads that come through. So like search engine optimization, it's free marketing until somebody, you know, comes your way. So how could you not do it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, that's a good point because, you know, in my former life working in radio, someone buys a campaign and, you know, they've paid for air. And if the end of that one month, they don't have the sales, they've already paid for it. It's done. But with affiliate marketing, you don't have that. That's exactly right. In a sense, it's like a store that you can put your, your, your product on the shelves and then only pay if people buy it. So, you know, as long as you can convert on the back end and make money, you got to do affiliate marketing. Absolutely. And just look at who has, who has a target audience that, I mean, I've learned this. I helped grow Snapple around uh, the country and, and then uh, Hotwire. And I went around and met with all the radio personalities. And then we measured how they were doing. And the ones that were truly most passionate about the product and the ones whose audiences really wanted to follow them, like Howard Stern, actually, he had a lot of power because if he really liked a product, his audience just followed him. And if he didn't, they could tell. So he loved Snapple. He would talk about Snapple even when we weren't paying him to talk about Snapple. And that just, it just spread like wildfire. Um, but then other products he, he didn't like so much and he would just dutifully read the script and his, his audience knew he didn't care. Oh, yeah. And I sold the Howard Stern Network um, oh, in did. my early days of radio. I believe it. And it was $1,000 for a spot. And this was, you know, fucking 20 years ago. So mm-hmm. you can imagine if you had spent $1,000 for 60 seconds of his time and he doesn't give a shit about your product. Oh, yeah. And I don't have to imagine it. I had a few products like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time. This has been a lot of fun. And I think it's important. Like you said, I have been in marketing and storytelling my whole career. So a lot of the things that are just easy for me, it's not easy for other people. And so I wanted to just give people a starting point and a place to jump off from, to give them a little bit of confidence to create cannabis marketing that does something important for our entire industry. I feel like I represent cannabis in a really positive way. I want to be the girl next door who can talk to you about cannabis and totally change the way you feel about it. And then when I see some of the other stuff out there, it makes me feel ashamed of my industry. So, you know, I would just like all of us to level up in cannabis. God bless you. (laughs) And you know what? I think that that's, it's such a worthy mission, but I think it's also a recipe for success. In the end, sometimes, you know, the tacky prevails in the short run. Uh, in the long run, people people like something that they can look up to and something that elevates them and something that leads them to, to higher ground. Um, so, yeah, be that. I think yes. I, I think it's great. And, I, and thank you for for, help, for letting me be part of, of your mission. Absolutely. In a world that's going to hell in a handbasket, be inspiring. There you go. <laughs> hey, hey that, put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> we got like a t-shirt every 10 minutes here. I like it. Let's do it. All right. Well, thank you all for hanging out. I hope today's podcast has your wheels turning and you're inspired to re-examine your brand and your marketing efforts with fresh eyes. Society is in a constant state of evolution, so get excited about experimenting and mixing things up. And if you found value in this chat, you are going to love the podcast 226 show notes at casuallybaked.com. You'll find some Digo case studies and data from the company's Positive Behavior Change Index. I also linked an informative blog that New Frontier Data recently released, discussing their 2022 Cannabis Digital Marketing Survey and the recent Cannabis Marketing Summit in Denver, Colorado. 
New Frontier Data's CEO Gary Allen told attendees, quote, Last year, there were about 50 million unique individuals who legally purchased cannabis in the United States. There are about 164 million pro-cannabis consumers in the United States, which means that there are a little over 100 million people still sitting on the bench. Our job is to bring those consumers into this market. End quote. Based on New Frontier Data's analysis of state legalization efforts, There are nine states likely to legalize adult-use cannabis by 2030, with another nine states likely to legalize it for medical use. Should all 18 of those states indeed pull the trigger on legalization over the next eight years, that means that 96% of Americans will live in states with some form of legal cannabis access and a projected $72 billion total will be spent in the legal market by 2030. Of course, projections aren't always accurate, but what is undeniable is that cannabis will be mainstream before we know it. So stick with it. Stay focused. Define your cannabis contribution and hone it. And have fun doing it. If you want to connect or collaborate with me, email your messages, requests, or can of curious questions through the website or DM me on social. When I'm there, I'm at Casually Baked on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, The Weed Tube, and Truth Social. However you decide to support our highly responsible cannabis movement, thank you for doing your part to Puff Puff Pass It On. Yes, it's a high time. We had a high time together. Casually Baked the Podcast was created, recorded, and produced by yours truly. Editing and sound design are in the capable hands of Jamie Humiston at PodConnects. The podcast theme music is by my highly talented friend, Seth Walker. If you aren't familiar with Seth's music, you can find High Time on his album, Gotta Get Back wherever you're buying your music these days. I know he didn't create high time for me, but it sure as shit sounds like he did, right? I hope you'll tune in next time. Thanks for hanging out. Hey there, this is Cheryl Murray Powell Esquire, and I'm the host of the Terps in the City podcast. I am a cannabis agricultural dietary supplement and trade attorney. I'm also a hemp farmer, and I've been recently named to the list of High Times Magazine's top 100 influencers in cannabis. I'm inviting you to follow me along my journey as I move back to New York to support the adult use market there. You're going to get a chance to listen to conversations with some of my friends along the way. I look forward to seeing you at Terps in the City.